All right, next up we have Carla. Yes. Carla, Carla Cruz Godoy. At the time of recording this, uh, Carla was the most recent interview that I put out there. Got a big pop, uh, both in terms of the interview, as well as I know she popped a bit on the Survivor 43 preview that we saw at the end of Survivor 42. She had that very fun, candid moment where she's like, what would I do to win this game? I don't think there's anything I would I wouldn't do to win this game. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't have that Car conversation with herself either. Exactly. Uh, but I do think Carla, as she'll talk about in our interview, has a really fantastic story of triumphing from the most arduous of circumstances. Uh, you know, perhaps the economic equivalent of being down four to eight at the merge and uh, foa foeing her way to the top into a really fantastic position earning one of the most prestigious scholarships in the nation and she's hoping that that hard work and resilience will be able to also pay off on the beach as well okay all right here is carla why are you here on survivor i'm here on survivor well one to obviously win but um i really i kind of i was tired of watching survivor on tv i was honestly i was really just tired of, of saying well like I would do this differently or like, what if, you know, this person did that? I wish I could be there. And um, I've just always been the type of person to just be like, if, you know, go for it, like do it. If that's something you want to do, then, then just do it. And so um, I kind of mustered up the courage and I was like, let me just apply. And I did. <laughs> and, and here I am. Um, but also I wanted to, I saw this lack of representation for, um, queer, queer women of color and, and Chicanas, um, Latinas, uh, in the show. And I was like, I need, I need to be there. Right. Like I, that was it. I was like, we need to, we need to change things up a bit. Um, so that's why, that's why Survivor. What's your history Potato. with watching Survivor? Yes. Yeah. So I love these answers for a number of reasons. First, uh, this idea, right. That like, while the DEI, uh, you know, policies that have been instituted in the new era have been fantastic there are some people that maybe still still feel a bit underrepresented uh carla talked about you know being a queer woman of color she talked later about being a, a plus size woman as well how that type isn't necessarily represented on the show and so it really is again just an early indicator of this philosophy for her of just like as she vocalized if you don't like your position change it you know there's there's no one that can really institute change but you but I also low-key love this between Carla and James and, and some other people before about how we talked about this with Roxroy last season about how some people, the reason why they play Survivor is that they're sitting on the couch being like, yeah, I'm sick of like backs, but you know, kind of Monday morning quarterbacking a bunch of other players. I'm just like uh, yelling at them to do this thing. I'm going to be the person to be yelled at now. Yeah, I think in the case of Roxroy, I feel like that was he watching the show and then his wife said like, OK, yeah. you, you have to go do it now. Like I do. Yeah, it was very much. Yeah, they were watching a season thirty nine episode, and he's like, "Oh, what are you doing? Come on!" She's like, "If you think you're so damn good at this game, why don't you go apply and see if you can actually do it?" Uh, mm -hmm. And so I do not think that it was necessarily that much of a mandate for Carla, but I still love this idea of you watch the show time in and time out, and it's less so about like, "Oh, I think I could be good for this," and more so like, "I want to show these idiots how it's done and not be one of them." Mm hmm. Okay, let's go back to Carla. Right. What's your history with watching Survivor? Yes. So um, I went to UC Berkeley for undergrad. And that is something that I'm going to try to keep on the DL because I know how sometimes the institutions that we go to can be used against us. Um, but at Berkeley, I was taking an education class and I met um, one of my friends, Dane, and he came up to me and he was like, do you watch Survivor? And I think this was like in 2014, 2015. And I was like, no, because for me, my understanding, I just thought Survivor was like a white people show, like honestly. And I, you know, I was like, no, I don't watch it. And he's like, girl, you need to watch it immediately because it's all, like, he went to explain, but I think the one thing that got to me was like, you know, people are manipulating each other and, you know, they're really forming relationships and getting to know one another. But ultimately the people that you vote out, they vote to decide who the winner is. And so that hooked me and I started watching it with him and I got my wife into it. Um, and then we would host watch parties it got to the point where we would then um, play Survivor at a bar with our friends and our friends hated us for that. And Survivor kind of has just followed me everywhere I've gone. So after uh, Berkeley, I moved to Washington, D.C., um, where I did my master's and I um, 
taught there. And in my apartment building, I met neighbors who were obsessed with Survivor. And so we have watch parties and I played gay kickball in D.C. And the people like like the folks in, in the gay kickball league, they had their own like Survivor day where people won money, um, you know, so like you'd apply to be a part of it. And so it has just it's and it's funny because it's kind of gone full circle. So now I live in, in New Jersey and I got hired for my new job in 2020. And the first thing I kind of told like this, they kind of put us together as a mentor. Um, well, not the first thing I said, but I, I overheard he was talking about Survivor. And I was like, wait, you watch Survivor? And now we have our weekly calls. It's called literally Chris and Carla talk about Survivor. And at this point, it's, you know, ingrained in my work, in my, you know, personal life with my friends and obviously with my wife. And we watch it almost we watch it like every, honestly every every day. Um, and we just jump from season to season. It doesn't matter if it's old school Survivor, like we're going to watch, or even Australian Survivor. We recently just got into that. So that's a little bit of my history. <laughs> Potato. Okay. A, that's well, a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a, little that's bit, a lot. A little bit. A lot. Okay. I mean, first of all, when is Survivor Day, Mike? Well, I think Survivor Day. Yeah, I think we need like, uh, listen, Biden, I think this is the main piece of legislation you need to accomplish. In I mean, she was in Washington, D.C., okay, uh, when it, this happened, okay? So play Survivor at a bar? Where do I sign up? Well, I think I think it's more so like, uh, and I've seen people do this before, right? You get your friends together, you sit around a table, and it's like, okay, we're all going to vote each other out one at a time. Which, listen, I, it makes sense why it would be in a place that... Really Winner gets that. left with the check. Joke's on you. Exactly. It's the opposite of the, the winning mm -hmm. fund. So, but I would imagine like it's good to do it in a place that readily supplies alcohol because I feel like people would need that after just like the bitterness and sadness they'd experience yeah. upon being voted out by their friends. Wow. But also imagine probably a, a little rowdy. I would, I'm sure there's a lot of screaming back and forth that would take place at certain yeah. points of the night. Mike, but what do you what about this for a game at, at, at the at the dinner at the bar? OK, you all had your your meals, your drinks. OK, you vote people you want to be voted out. OK, and now Ooh. so we have a round of voting person who is le is, goes, is last is left with the check. They have to pay pay the whole thing. So that's interesting. how good is your your get your social game to get voted out to be one of the people that gets taken off the hook? So it's like everyone wants to be Aussie in South Pacific, right? It's like send me to to redemption, you know, yes. send me out of there. That yes. way I don't need to be left holding the check. Uh, it's an interesting it's a different game but an interesting one um but boy um yeah all right so uh carla loves survivor watches it every day mike yeah which is interesting because she like from the way she vocalizes it it has very much followed her throughout her life but it's been entirely coincidental right mm -hmm. we're like yes she was initially brought into the show but then like she happens to move to dc and she meets people that are obsessed with the show. Mm -hmm. She joins this kickball league that does this like LRG, you know, one day game of Survivor. She moves mm -hmm. to New Jersey where her mentor happens to watch Survivor. Yeah. Are we What's sure so Car Carla and Chris talk about Survivor isn't a podcast already? All right, let me check the Apple reviews. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe maybe we can already get some introspection a la Ricard, right? Into like what her full, what her strategy for the game might be like. Yeah. I don't, well, how? Where does that name like? She says it's named something. Is that like their their standing appointment on their Google? Calendar? I think that's the Where's literal the name? name of the appointment on the calendar. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. Which is like a very fun idea of like a standing appointment to check in with their former work mentor about better than what most day. of my meetings are on the calendar. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe should you change the podcast to like Robin Blake Talk Survivor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Should we hear more about what Carla has to say? Absolutely. She has a voluminous uh, history with Survivor and her various relationships. But how does that translate to the game? Let's see what she has to say about that. Sure. Give me one Survivor winner and one non-winner who you identify with the most. Yes, perfect. So um, I'll start with a non-winner that I identify with. So Sri, Sri Fields. I love her and I feel like she's, you know, a favorite for a lot of people, but to me, I identify with her the most because one, I'm, I'm a plus size woman, right? And it's really hard to see plus size women on Survivor. I think that's another, you know, it took a lot of guts for me to apply. I was really scared um, because the perception, right? Like, I don't want people to see me and be like, oh, this girl's weak. But hearing Suri's story is very similar to my story in the sense that, you know, she got off the couch and I literally did the same thing. Um, 
because I'm, you know, I was just tired. I was tired of watching people and I wanted to challenge myself. And so not only because of Ceri's story, but Ceri's social game, I'm a, I'm a social butterfly. I can literally meet a stranger and then ask them to go to a bar and we'll drink. Like that's the type of person I am. I love to have friends. Um, I love to make friends and I love to get to know people. And I can dig a lot of information out of them by just being genuine and, you know, interested. So Suri, I connect to in that way. And um, a winner, uh, Tony, I think Tony's strategy, um, but also his ability to have fun is something that I relate to the most. Um, you know, he wasn't afraid to to turn people against each other, similar to Sandra, but he also wasn't afraid to, to start lies and start rumors. And I think um, just, he was just willing to to go and, you know, build a shack, like, you know, a hiding shack to go and eavesdrop on people. Like, that's something that it'll be a little hard, but I'm going to be eavesdropping in a different way, hopefully. Um, and he just has a confidence that that I feel like I can I can emulate in a way like I, I can mirror that. Um, and maybe it's a cop thing. I don't know. Maybe it's a Jersey thing. Um, but it just feels very, to me, I can relate to, not that I'm a cop or from Jersey, but I live in Jersey. So yeah, a, a mix, a mix of Tony and Sri. What's your favorite? Yeah. A mix of Tony and Sri. I mean, I'd sign up for that. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I'll have what I'll have that on the menu personally. Uh, it's like my, the, what is it? Like the McGang bang, like the, the burger and the chicken sandwich on top of each other. Like, yeah. Mix is that together. what it's called? I quite literally, I believe that's what it's called. Oh my God. All right. Um, but I, I like what's, uh, Carla is talking about, uh, you know, she wants to, uh, do the strategy, but also have fun with it. Not be a game yeah. bot. No, and I think she is going to be one to watch from a personality perspective. And I really loved what she has to say about like, you know, her being a social butterfly. I think she, you know, she's an educational project manager, has her master's in education. So I think dealing with people in the classroom, I think does allow you to just naturally be that social person. We saw with Tommy Sheehan, we saw to a certain extent with Ron Clark as well. Like I actually think it's, that's a fairly underrated position in terms of how occupational skills can apply to the game where you have to be ready on the fly for anything, but also you have to be like able to get on the same level as so many different types of personalities and solve so many different types of problems. I think Carla's really underlining a lot of great stuff. Plus, hopefully she's able to create this quote unquote hiding shack that she loves so much from Tony. Mm -hmm. Hiding shacks are great. Okay. All right. Back to Carla. Mix of Tony and Sri. What's your favorite moment in Survivor history? The all women's alliance with Parv um, and that Eric moment. That's my favorite moment um, where they literally convinced this kid to give up his immunity so that they could get away with, you know, going to the final uh, three, well, obviously, you know, four and vote all the men out. Um, I just thought it was so wise. It was so... It was like the epitome of what old school survivor was, right? Like really, really using their social um, dominance in a way to get what they wanted. Um, the girls, the women work together well. And I think it's, it's one of my favorites because, you know, women, it's, it sucks to say that it's so hard for, you know, women to come together without people assuming that there's going to be an all girls alliance because of that exact moment. Right. So like, because that happened, it's a lot harder now to do that. Um, but if I could do something similar, I would love to do that. That for me, that was just like a hooray moment. What's one life experience you feel has prepared you most for the game? When I, when I talk about my, it's hard to say one life experience because my life, you know, is super intersectional, but um, I think growing up low income, growing up, I grew up in San Diego. Um, my parents, uh, immigrants of Mexico. Um, and I was born here in the U S and watching, not just watching, but, you know, like struggling while growing up um, was tough. And it kind of built this resiliency in me that I feel, you know, that I carry everywhere I go. And going from being, you know, poor, um, and my parents worked a lot. So my grandparents raised me. 
and my, you know, my parents didn't graduate from high school. My older brother didn't graduate from high school. It, it, it felt like the cards were stacked against me. Um, and, but I wasn't, I wasn't going to give up that easily. And so I think I'm, I'm just a very, I'm a critical thinker, but I'm also very, um, introspective. And even at a young age that seeing what was around me and seeing kind of like what was set up for me, I was like, nah, this is not going to happen. And so I kind of took it upon myself to, to do what I had to do to get out of the situation that I was born into. Um, and so, I think because of that and just like, you know, I was able to, I think one, to add to this one really cool thing about me and, and I, is, is that like, you know, I've worked so hard for everything that I have. Um, in high school, I won the Bill and Melinda Gates scholarship, Millennium Scholarship, which has allowed me to go and get receive you know, my undergrad degree, my bachelor's, my master's. And if I wanted to, my doctorate for free, I, I have zero dollars in debt um, because of this scholarship and it was because of all the hard work and goal setting and just like will sheer will and determination to say like, this is the situation I'm going to get out of and I'm going to break that generational curse and I'm going to make my ancestors proud. That ability to do that at 14 to 18 years old is what's going to best prepare me for survivor. Um, I know what struggle is, right? Like I know what being hungry is like. And I know what it's like to to play someone, um, whether it's lying to them, whether it's, you know, making people feel good, um, because those are, that's the life I've had to live early on. And then I'm able to, to code switch easily coming from from San Diego, from City Heights. Um, you know, you, you learn to be tough. You learn how to protect yourself and stand up for yourself. But then going to institutions like UC Berkeley and Johns Hopkins that's a totally different kind of community and environment you grew up in. You're, you're, you're mingling with future lawyers. You're mingling with future doctors. It's, it's a totally different um, social game, if you say it. And so all of that put together, um, I think is going to help me win for sure. All right. Mike, overall, I, I love the profile from Carla. I mean, I feel like that a, as a player, you know, she brings a lot to the table, uh, super smart, knows the game, very social, wants to have fun, excited to be there. All those things are good. The only thing that I think is a downside for her is that I feel like, and especially I think that these are sort of like emphasized in the six person tribes, is that I don't know necessarily like how she's going to fare in the challenges. Yeah, but I would also say, we didn't talk about this a lot, but like James was someone who vocalized as well in my interview, right? He's like, I don't know if I'll be very good at the challenges. There's a reason why the two of them both compare themselves to Sari. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know if she would necessarily be served up. And we'll talk about our next two people as well, whether or not like she would be the first de facto boot here. I love Carla, not only based on her personality, which I think she's going to bring a lot to this season, but I think she has her head in a really, really good place. Honestly, Rob, she is giving me so many Shan vibes where mm -hmm. Shan was someone who had a career that was naturally about making social connections, similarly had this background, right, where she came from a more impoverished, lower rung on the ladder type of childhood and like had to manually work her way out of that situation through, you know, her own skills, maybe a bit of duplicity as well into a career and a lifestyle that she is incredibly proud of now. And that hustle shouldn't be ignored. We talked about this with Jesse as well. You learn a lot about yourself and a lot of like bare bones people skills, I would say, working through all that. I love what Carla had to say about code switching, right? Again, much like Jesse, I think she has that experience of like growing up in more lower income places with like interacting with those people and then going to academia and interacting with very different types of people she has a really good grasp as to all the different types of personalities that she might possibly run into in survivor and i think that's going to then overwrite much like shan herself who i think was not the strongest challenge competitor i think that would probably overwrite a bit more of those physical limits like i could see a situation where coco loses and they're like yeah but we can't lose carla because uh, I think Carla could also be somebody that is working hard. Again, has a very hard work ethic. I could see her ingratiating herself by working around camp as well. There are just so many arrows pointing up right now for me with Carla. My only downside 
is she talks about this in her video and she spoke about it a bit right at the end of that interview with this idea of like, I know how to deceive people sometimes I have to steal to get to what I want. She said in her video, she doesn't have a hard time lying. Mm-hmm. And much like we saw with Shan, where again, like all of these little webs she built ended up crashing down in one fell swoop. This is sort of the new era of Survivor where this happens with players like when we lost Hi, Drea and Omer, or, you know, right in a row that the people that are sometimes often most out in front end up getting clipped uh, before yeah. making it to the end. I could see something similar happening with Carla, but I think any any like sort of misgivings about her getting targeted early in the game, I actually don't see necessarily. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not too worried about uh, her lying too much. Like, I feel like as long as you don't get messy with it, I feel like it's uh, not going to be an issue. I, I think I just need to see what the rest of the tribe makeup is going to be in terms of if they're going to be able to avoid enough tribal councils. And I also could see a scenario where, kind of like Shan, I could see Carla putting herself sort of like at the center of everything where she's able to insulate herself from potentially like going to tribal council three times before the merge. That's exactly what I'm thinking of like, if she does end up going pre-merge, I think it would be an UWA situation where like, there are only three or maybe even two people left at the end of the day where like everyone feels good about her. I read a couple good. of stuff, uh, stuff from her bio. What is something we would never know from looking at you? People are mostly surprised at how competitive I am, especially as I get older. It's as if people think I should have outgrown that phase of my life by now. I come across as non-threatening and it's very intentional on my part this is going to help me in the game. And again, that's Cassie was speaking about that as well. I don't know. Eventually if we're just going to have a bunch of beta players being like, I don't know what we want to do. What do you want to do? I think there'll suddenly be people that will take charge. But again, much like we talked up with Cassidy, I think she has a good sense as to like when to hold back, when to make people perceive her as just like bubbly, friendly, down to earth person, and then be able to actually weaponize that and then utilize it later on. Okay. Mike, anything else on Carla? Uh, which past survivor will you most play the game like? She does a bit of a Frankenstein's monster here in her bio. Natalie, mental and physical strength. Sarah, strategic. Mich- Michelle, social. Hmm. And she invoked Tony in, in our interview, right? So essentially she named the entire Winners of War Final Four. Okay. I'm just trying to think of like... Yeah, I guess that would be a good player to have, right? The physical strength of Natalie Anderson. I'm assuming yeah. that's the Natalie she referenced. But Sarah was, strate- was strategic? Yeah, I would say Sarah was more social, right? Like, that was her entire Game Changers game. was, like, making those bonds and then weaponizing them. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, interesting. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, like, I guess Sarah would be that odd sort of area between strategic and social, right? Mm-hmm. Of, like what made those bonds and then utilize those bonds to be like, okay, now I'm going to make this move just goes to show how like there really is no such thing as strategic or social. It really is one flowing into the other. Uh, and obviously at this point, she had not seen the challenge USA version of Sarah mm-hmm. Lucy, or maybe she would mm-hmm. change that answer. Mm-hmm. Okay. 